Hi, we are back with the third episode of our 16-part documentary, which aims to shed light on the darkest chapter of German history and the harsh realities of the Second World War. In this episode, we will look at the Luftwaffe's air battles against the Royal Air Force, in order to gain air superiority to carry out the planned landings and invasion of Great Britain. Soldiers returning from the front were greeted with enthusiasm. In the town of Bruxelles in Baden, the population gave a warm welcome to a bicycle squadron stationed in this town. An American observer noted, I have never witnessed such boundless enthusiasm. The Germans were laughing and crying with spontaneous joy. Never before or since has there been such a reception. From the point of view of the vast majority of the population, once France had surrendered, it was no longer impossible to reach an agreement with Britain, which Hitler had always strived for. One could read in Mein Kampf how he imagined how the world would be divided. And his magnificent peace proposal of July 19, 1940 was perhaps serious in this respect. Hitler's ideas about how the world should be divided were clear. Great Britain would dominate the seas and the overseas territories, Germany would dominate continental Europe. Germany's dominance of the European continent was absolutely non-negotiable. I think the majority of the population wanted the war to end in this way, and I think this was also the prevailing tendency among the officers. The German offer was met with a firm rejection by Prime Minister Churchill. Churchill's ability at this stage to ensure that the war cabinet would not listen to this tempting idea of a comprehensive peace agreement was one of the most important decisions of the entire war. Because if the British had given up at that moment and Churchill had not thought, if we go down the negotiating route, we lose, they would never have gotten out of it. Churchill was convinced that from that moment on there had to be total resistance and unconditional determination to see the war through to the end. But the British had no grand strategic plan at this point other than to survive and to control the sea lanes as much as possible. For Britain was dependent on the empire's overseas territories for both supplies and material. And also, of course, almost all, or at least a large proportion of the troops fighting overseas were citizens of the colonial countries. It was therefore vital to protect the empire's supply routes. Britain was expecting an invasion by the Wehrmacht, and so the British Home Guard armed themselves against the enemy. If, contrary to expectations, the Germans advanced inland, they would be met with a variety of camouflage tactics. Hitler wanted to force the British to surrender. Hermann Goering launched air strikes against Britain in preparation for the German invasion of the British Isles. Churchill knew, he needed a strong partner in arms against the Germans. Churchill was an adventurer, he loved war and never accepted defeat. In July 1940, after all foreseeable contingencies, Britain was an absolutely helpless and decadent power. But Churchill had an English father and an American mother. So he played the game, that had already proved extraordinarily useful in the First World War. He tried to figure out how to get the vast American continent, the largest financial and manufacturing power of the time, on his side and drag them into the war. OK, the Germans could now use the airfields in occupied Belgium, the Netherlands and northern France and carry heavier bomb loads instead of large fuel tanks. But in air battles with the Royal Air Force, German pilots also suffered heavy defeats, having developed many new techniques and gained experience, since the Spanish Civil War, the German Air Force was extremely well prepared. There was area bombing, attacks with Stukas, even bombs, a kind of precursor to napalm. They had also developed combat techniques that the British had to copy. But all this was not enough, there was a fundamental lack of leadership. Especially in Goering's strategies. Initially, they followed the correct strategy of concentrating their attacks on airfields weakening the resistance of the Royal Air Force more and more. But then, with his typical impatience, Goering suddenly made London a much more symbolic and prestigious target, the main target of attack. It was this that saved the Royal Air Force from the critical situation in which it found itself. According to the Führer's desire, the capital of the British Empire had to be wiped off the map. For months London was the main target of German attacks. 
In the following months of 1940, 23,000 people were killed by air raids. Almost every neighborhood of the city was reduced to ruins. Fighting morale in Great Britain was still high, and Winston Churchill, confident of this, mobilized the public with fiery speeches. Churchill still hoped that the United States would soon enter the war. He could only win this European war if he succeeded in turning it into a world war. It suited his temperament, his courage and was the only chance he saw to save his empire. Because nobody in Britain believed that a defeated Britain could hold India, could control the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. So Churchill's only option was to turn the war into a world war, and he used the only option he had to save the British Empire, to save this sinking ship. The British Empire had long been threatened with disintegration. In India, one of the main pillars of the empire, resistance to the colonial rulers was rising. After the last major uprising, Indians had been granted the same rights as the British. However, the ruthless exploitation of India by the British led to poverty and famine, while modernization failed to reach the peasant masses. The independence movement led by Mahatma Gandhi was now openly challenging white supremacy. India wanted to enter the war only in exchange for independence. The British ignored this demand and declared war on Germany on behalf of India. In the Far East, the Empire of Japan invaded Manchuria in pursuit of its colonial ambitions. To deter China, the Japanese Air Force bombed Shanghai. The great powers of the Second World War were the empires, dominating the territories they had conquered by force, and Japan, their model student in the field of imperialism, did the same step by step. They developed their industry, militarized their empire on the European model and in a sense they became the pride of Asia. Japan gradually advanced from the northeast of China, from Manchuria, along the coast, through Beijing to Shanghai. And in 1937 started a war for the total domination of China, in which the Western power sided with the poor, occupied Chinese, but they could not find a way to stop the Japanese. Japan moved to take control of all of China. On September 27, 1940, on Hitler's initiative, a new alliance was signed in Berlin between Germany, Italy, and Japan, called the Triple Power Pact. This pact was the basis for the surrealist claim of three empires, preparing to divide the world among themselves. Italy's sphere of influence would be the Mediterranean region, Germany would want to control all of Europe and Eastern Europe. And Japan would dominate East Asia. With this show of strength, the Japanese in particular believed that the United States could be deterred from entering the war. The Japanese lost a great deal of sympathy in USA and England, because they allied with the devil of the world, Nazi Germany. But the alliance was in fact a treaty that gave Japan no gain in military power. In fact, the Western world was shooting itself in the foot. The shared dominance of the white, Christian, Imperial Brothers over the Eastern Hemisphere was becoming fragile, weak, and increasingly contentless. The people they held in the palm of their hands there felt it. They were aware that this hand was weakening. Along with Japan, in fact, these ignorant, weak and poor peoples also left the Western world. So there was a serious enemy for the Western world. But as early as December, Hitler had ordered that the planning for war against the Soviet Union should be completed by May 1941. Hitler's decision to attack was encouraged by various events in Russia. It must be remembered that Stalin's liquidation of the Red Army seemed to be a great advantage, which Hitler, of course, secretly enjoyed. For it meant that the frightened Soviet generals would probably be incapable of making the right decisions. Hitler was also aware, of the Red Army's poor performance in the Winter War against Finland. This gave him the idea, that all he wanted to do was kick in the door and the whole rotten building would collapse. At that moment Hitler realized that he had a chance. If he had hesitated longer, Stalin would have realized the threat that the collapse of Britain and France posed to him. Then Stalin would have rearmed and prepared and would have been in a much better position to fight Germany. So time planning was very important. To bring Britain to its knees, Hitler bombed targets in Britain relentlessly. 
but for the first time the Nazi leadership had to admit defeat. The German army was not in a position to occupy the island. We have now reached the end of the third episode of our documentary about the Second World War. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and activate notifications so that you don't miss any further episodes. See you in the fourth episode of our documentary.